greetings in truth and love. It's such a joy to be with you and to have the pleasure of sharing with you God's revelation of his own truth. However, before we even approach our theme for this record, let us ask ourselves one question. Why are we listening to these words? Well, when we find the answer to this question, we'll find them in the eighth chapter of John. Here Jesus is recorded as saying, He that is of God heareth God's words. This is fundamental truth. It indicates that the very fact of your listening to this revelation means that you are the mind that is God. You know, it takes the mind that is God to be interested in the Word of God. Yes, it must be the mind that is God in order to accept and respond to the things of God. You will remember that you are the Word that is God. The Word that is God is God's expression of Himself. So you are the very Word that you are hearing. You are the very expression that you are hearing this very instant. But you realize that if you are this Word, I am this Word also, for we are one consciousness, one God, one being expressed. This, of course, means that there is one mind speaking, one mind hearing. We are one. It is true that each individual is a specific, distinct identity, and no other identity can usurp the identity that you are. But it is also true that each individual is the mind that is God, identified as that specific individual. There can be no such thing as one mind speaking the Word of God and another mind listening to the Word of God. Rather, right here, right now, there is the mind that is God evidencing itself as the mind of you and as the mind of the I that I am. So you see, I shall not lecture at you. I shall not even talk to you. Instead, we shall commune as the one mind and we shall remind ourselves of the truth we already know, we shall remind ourselves of the truth we already are. Now let us turn to the subject for this particular record. Before Abraham was, I am. Do you know this is one of the most powerful, one of the most enlightening statements in the Bible. Now, no doubt you'll remember the occasion upon which Jesus made that profound statement. You remember the scribes and Pharisees had asked Jesus, Where is thy father? Jesus had answered, Why, ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye would have known my father also. Now, in the course of the discussion, they informed Jesus that Abraham was their father. And it was immediately after this that Jesus declared, Before Abraham was, I am. This conversation is of tremendous importance to all of us. You see, the scribes and Pharisees were identifying, or rather, we should say, they were misidentifying themselves and Jesus. They were misidentifying themselves and Jesus as direct descendants of Abraham. Now, of course, Abraham would have to be a descendant of Adam. If we were human, mortals, 
we would all have to be descendants of Adam. So actually, they were identifying themselves as the descendants of man whose breath is in his nostrils. Yet, in Isaiah, they've been told that they were to cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. You know that great prophet Isaiah had many flashes of pure illumination. But let us return to Jesus' statement, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus realized that not one of them had really seen him. He knew that what they thought they saw was that man whose breath is in his nostrils, that descendant of Adam. Jesus knew that there actually was no man with breath in his nostrils. Furthermore, he knew that there was no man who was created. He knew that there was no man who began and who must change, deteriorate, age, and die. He refused to accept that spurious misidentification of his eternal changeless being. He claimed no man as his father. Rather, he claimed his identity as eternal God, identified, individualized, and evident. He claimed it not only for himself, but for all. Now this is evidenced by his works. And he, his own realization of this fact was that which brought forth the evidence of perfection whenever he was asked for help. Yes, Jesus claimed his genuine identity. And he knew, too, that whether they knew it or not, they, too, were this same God identified. And this is exactly what we are beginning to do. Now, you know, those of us who are perceiving the ultimate are claiming our eternal identity. And we know that we are not human. We are not mortal beings with bodies of matter. We know nothing of bodies that begin, change, and end. We are not sons and daughters of man with breath in his nostrils. Our kingdom is not of this world. We are not subject to the accepted beliefs of birth, age, disease, and death. Our kingdom is not of this world, and we are not subject to any of the so-called laws associated with man with breath in his nostrils. You know, I like that word consciousness instead of the word kingdom. When we say our kingdom is not of this world, you know what we're really saying is our consciousness is not a consciousness of the world that they claim to be matter. Rather, our consciousness is God, spirit, being conscious of just what it is and nothing else. Now, for years we've said that God is the only life, and we've said that life is eternal. This is true. But yet the emphasis has been placed on eternal life after death, or after life is supposed to have departed from the body. Well, why have we so supinely accepted this deception, this deception that life must depart from the body? It's because we have gone right on believing that life enters the body. Now the Bible tells us that death is to be overcome. And we are promised the realization of eternal life. But how are we ever going to escape the appearance of death so long as we accept the appearance of birth? Anything that has beginning must also have ending. What is it that is supposed to begin? What is it that is supposed to change and to end? the body. 
So the revelation pertaining to this seeming beginning and ending must be that we have entertained a mistaken concept about the body. And that is just about what it is. We have misinterpreted the eternal body, and we have seemed to superimpose a kind of body that begins, that changes, that ends. In my book, The Ultimate, there is a chapter entitled Body. Now you have read The Ultimate, and you are becoming aware that life does not enter the body, and neither does it depart from the body. So I shall not go very deeply into the subject of body for this record. It's all there in the ultimate. Suffice it to say that we are discovering that the body is as eternal as is the soul. The body is as eternal as is the life. For the body is the soul. The body is the life in form. If by any chance you have not read the ultimate, these statements may be seen startling. They may seem very unrealistic. Yet we know that whenever any great truth is discovered, it always seems shocking. It always seems untrue until it is understood. And furthermore, until it has proved itself to be true. Now, I doubt that there is anyone listening to this record, who has not at some time or other seen the operation of truth nullify and obliterate some inharmonious appearance of matter, some appearance that seemed very real. Many of our finest physicians will tell you that they have seen miraculous recoveries and that these recoveries have been directly contrary to every material law in connection with that particular situation. Of course, this is startling, but it does reveal the fact that these so-called laws of matter are not really laws at all, not at all. They are only accepted beliefs, and anything that opposes these beliefs can seem to be strange and even untrue. But let us return to this word, beginning. Throughout the ages, the attempt has been made to explain the beginning of the world, the beginning of the universe, and the beginning of man. Every religion begins with an explanation of how it all began. Most of them also explain how it is expected that all of this should, should have to come to an end. Now, from this standpoint, it is only natural that the end of the world and all existence would be considered inevitable. How could it be otherwise, when it is all supposed to have begun? The point, of course, at which we are arriving is this. If we are to perceive that the individual is without beginning, without ending, we must first perceive that the universe is without beginning or ending. Why? Because each individual is included in the completeness of the beginningless, endless universe. You know there are some who deny this universe. They say it's all imagination, that it's all outpicturing of our own minds. Well, this I cannot accept. This universe is real. This universe is genuine. But this universe is changeless and eternal. All that comprises this universe is just as real, is just as eternal, as is the universe itself. Of course, I'm not speaking of a material universe. I'm not speaking about a universe that's composed of matter. But neither am I speaking of a mortal man or a man with a body of matter. Just as we have misinterpreted the nature of the body, of that which we call man, so we have misinterpreted the nature of the universe. Neither the universe or the body exist as they appear. 
And actually, they only appear to be matter to uh, an illusory sense of life, which is not you, which is not me, and which is not our genuine and only sense of life at all. This is exactly why Jesus knew that those scribes and Pharisees had never seen him. They had seen something that they misinterpreted to be a body of matter, and they had called that, they had called that false, assumptory, illusory picture of the one named Jesus. They had called that the Christ. You know, even the churches and some of the physicists are beginning to suspect that there is at least some of God in what they call man. We could have told them that long ago. Only we know that there is more than some of God in what we call man. We know that all ex that exists of what we call man is God. Would we know that there was such a thing as a specific identity called man if there were no body? Of course not. Well, then doesn't this mean that in order to really perceive what the identity is, we must know that which comprises the body. It is the body about which we have been mistaken. Now, you know, the substance of the universe, as well as the substance of the body, are life, consciousness, spirit, truth. Now, this is all that comprises the universe, and this is all that comprises the body, and it can all be said in one little three-letter word, G-O-D. Yes, the universe and all it includes is genuine. It is not only genuine, it is eternal, and it is indestructible. You, the specific individual you, are included in this universe, and you, all that exists of you, including your substance, that is the substance of your body, you are as eternal and uh, as indestructible as is this universe. Now there have been and are many who have seen this universe as it is and not as it appears to be. We are not the only one who are seeing this universe as it is. There are many scattered throughout the world, but most of us don't say very much about it yet. Any of you who have read Cosmic Consciousness by Buck know the beauty, the grandeur, and the indestructible nature of the universe when perceived by the enlightened consciousness. But there are many who have had this experience and they never made it public. Why didn't they make it public? Because they didn't wish the ridicule. They didn't wish the doubt. They didn't wish to have the beauty, the glory that they had seen and known to be the universe, maligned by organized or unorganized ignorance. A few years ago, there was an article in the Reader's Digest. Now, in this article, the writer told of a wonderful experience in which she had revealed right before her gaze the universe as it really is. Strangely, this experience took place when she was convalescing from an operation in a hospital. On this particular day, she was in a wheelchair out in the hospital grounds. She was feeling quite blue and despondent. She noticed the foliage, and the, the uh, flowers around her, but she didn't pay very much attention to them. And suddenly, her eyes were opened, and she saw them as they were. Now, not one of those trees 
are those bushes, are those shrubs, disappeared from view. Every one of them stayed right there where it had been. Every shrub, every tree, every flower. Yet she saw it as it was. And she said that it was so much more beautiful than anything that she could have imagined it could be. It was so much more beautiful than it had appeared just a second before to a so-called material sense of sight that she was utterly transported into a glorious sense of being. Needless to say, her recovery was more rapid after that. Now, this woman didn't say that she ever became a true student or anything like that, but at the same time she did see this universe. She did see things as they are. She did see as the eye that is single. She did see as this inner eye, which is the consciousness that is your consciousness and my consciousness. This consciousness that reveals the universe, the stars, the planets, the earth planet, the body, as it is and not as it seems to be to this so-called man with breath in his nostrils. The point we are making here is that everything that exists remains in its highest state, if you like the word, of perfection. There is never anything in a process of deterioration or of destruction. There is no destructible substance in the kingdom of God, and there is no destructible substance in the consciousness, the God consciousness that you are, the God consciousness that actually is your universe. Here is an example of uh, clarifying. Let's clarify this point for a moment. Now, I have a friend who recently told me of this experience. One morning, she had gotten up quite early, and she had been contemplating the truth as it is expressed and revealed in the ultimate. Shortly after her husband left for birth, she went out onto the front veranda. Now, that very morning, prior to leaving for work, her husband had mowed the lawn, and he, he had mowed this grass just as close to the ground as he could possibly mow it. But suddenly, as she stood there, every blade of grass was standing up there in its full stature, so vitally alive, so intensely alive. And furthermore, she said, it seemed as though each blade of grass was announcing its completeness, its presence, itself as a very eternal, changeless life that it is. And don't you see, this grass couldn't be destroyed. Not one blade of this grass could be destroyed. Well, it says in the Bible, every hair of your head is numbered. Not one hair of your head can be destroyed. Material hair? Oh, no. No, not material at all. There is no matter, but even that which appears to be matter has behind it the absolute indestructible truth that there is no substance, no activity, no form that can perish from this which we call the earth. My own experience has been the same. I can remember in my library during the winter, looking across the street at trees in the middle of the winter that were completely barren, not a leaf, showing snow on the ground, and suddenly every leaf was right there in place. All the snow was there too. But there were no bare branches, and right, uh, standing right up through that snow was every blade of grass, green and beautiful and gloriously alive. This experience took place not once, 
but many times. And now I would like to tell you that never in illumination have I seen a withered blade of grass. Never have I seen anything that was not at its very peak of perfection. And somehow it always seems to be standing there in full consciousness of what it really is. Do you note the one salient point in these experiences I've spoken about? Well, it is this. Everything we see really does exist, but it is far more beautiful and grand than it has appeared to be, and above all, it is indestructible, changeless, imperishable. It remains at the very height of its eternal perfection, and it knows it. I often think of the story of the Transfiguration. Now, you remember that Jesus took uh, some of the disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And while they were standing there, Moses and Elias appeared before them. Now they saw them. Moses and Elias appeared with bodies. They saw bodies. But did they see bodies of matter? No. Their eyes were open, and they saw Moses and Elias including their bodies, as they really were indestructible, eternal, glorious, spiritual, beautiful. You'll remember that they spoke of Moses and Elias and of their faces being white and glistering. Well, I often think about that word glistering. But what he really meant was that their faces, the whole of Moses and Elias, was luminous, illumined consciousness. Illumined consciousness is the body as well as the consciousness itself. They saw Moses and Elias as they were and are. Now, did it ever occur to you that long, long before this, there had been many who thought they had buried the bodies of Moses and Elias, they put them in the ground. But had they buried these bodies? No, they never saw the bodies of Moses and Elias. They could not be seen by that which is called man with breath in his nostrils. They could not be seen by a so-called physical sense of sight. It is a so-called physical sense of sight, of vision, that seems to see matter bodies that begin, that are born, that age, that get sick, that become decrepit, that deteriorate and perish from the earth, that die. But this is not man. This is not the man. That is God himself identified. Oh, it is all right to say this word man when we know what we're talking about. It is already already here. It is all perfectly all right to say man when we know that all there is of man or of that which we call man is God identified. Actually, when we're aware of this, we realize that to say man is only another way of saying God. Now, I've heard some uh, who have said that when these disciples uh, were up there with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, that they were suffering an hallucination, that they never saw Moses and Elias at all. Well, let me tell you, this was no hallucination. None of these experiences that we have related here uh, were hallucinations. Most of these experiences have occurred with individuals who are leading practically normal every lives. It does not change anyone at all, excepting in this way. When we have these illuminations, we go right on. We go about our daily affairs with greater joy. We go about them with less fear, more assurance of the eternal nature of what our existence is and the existence of all. It's just as though the scales suddenly drop away from our eyes 
and we see things as they are. We see things as they really do exist instead of as they have appeared to exist before. You know, our friends the physicists are coming very close to the discovery of the genuine nature of the universe. Of course, they're interpreting it from a material standpoint, but they frankly admit that it is mind, it is a composed of mind, it is composed of intelligence in essence. There is at least one outstanding uh, physicist in our country who is beginning to perceive the beginningless, endless nature of the universe. Recently, the Saturday Evening Post included an article by him that ended by questioning something like this. Isn't it possible that the universe will never come to an end? And if the universe were never to come to an end, could it ever have had a beginning? Do you realize that whatever any of us see pertaining to the universe has to also be true pertaining to the body. Now, dear friend, can you see the wonderful release from fear this realization produces? If this universe, including each individual, is indestructible, and it is, how can nuclear warfare destroy it? What can annihilate the individual body if this body is soul, if this body is mind, life, consciousness, and form? This is nothing new at all. It has been perceived again and again throughout the ages. Do we have authority for this in the Bible? Indeed we do. Not that we need it. It would be true whether it said it in the Bible or not. But we do find in the Bible that Melchizedek is spoken of as being without father, without mother, without beginning or ending of days. No wonder Jesus could say, before Abraham was, I am. The realization of the eternal nature of your life, your being, your body, the universe, is not something that you can reason out or think out. It is not a revelation that comes through struggle or through labor. Rather, it comes when you least expect it. It comes when you are not thinking. It comes when you are not trying to reason. It comes when you are not even inviting it to come. It comes when your consciousness is full open. What do I mean by full open? The full open consciousness means your consciousness and mine when there is no little personal sense of self cluttering up the premises. I would like to share with you the experience that first brought this realization, this revelation to me, that I, as an individual, as a specific identity, was eternal, that my life never began, and that my life never began as the identical life that I am and have. Now, in my little booklet, Just Be Yourself, I've spoken of the fact that there was one woman who had her first illumination when viewing the Grand Canyon. Well, I didn't go into detail at the time, but I would like to share this experience with you because it was my own experience. Now, we had arrived at the Grand Canyon the night before, and it was dark, there was no moon, and we didn't see the canyon at all that night. However, we did attend a lecture in the lodge there, and the lecturer went into great detail about the strata of the canyon and about how many millions of years it had been in, in forming and so forth. Now, the next morning, I wakened very, very early with a great inner urge to go out 
and see the sun rise over the Grand Canyon. Somehow I felt that I must be alone, so I didn't even awaken my husband or my daughter. But I dressed quietly and went out to stand on the brink of the canyon and watch the sun rise. Now this is an interesting point. I could see as I looked back and forth along the rim that there were clusters of people here and there along, but to this spot, this particular place, where I had been almost pulled, there was no one standing excepting myself. And suddenly I began to see the sun come over the rim of the canyon. and. Gradually, it brought the light. It brought itself, really, as the light. And it just began to kiss the peak of the highest mountain in the canyon. And suddenly, my eyes were opened. And I saw that canyon as it was and is. Or it was all there. But it's the most glorious flame-like color. Flooded. It was just flooded with color. It was alive, not dead rocks. Nothing like that. It was life itself. Life, activity, color. Oh, it was beautiful. Then suddenly flashed into my mind that which the lecture had said about the millions of years that had been in farming. And I found myself shouting. Before this was, I am. And oh, dear one, I can't help telling you that right then and there for the first time, I knew that I was eternal. I knew what Jesus meant when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Why, of course, eternal as old and as young as God, as beginningless, as endless as God, the very specific, identical life that is my life, eternal, changeless, beginningless, endless. Before this was, I am. Can you see the wonderful release from fear this realization produces? If this universe, including each individual, is indestructible, and it is, how can anything destroy anyone? Now why has the truth, as it's presented in the ultimate, been revealed just now? Why is it being revealed? Why is this truth? that reveals the indestructible, imperishable nature of the body being revealed just now? Well, I'll tell you, because now it is most essential to know the nature of what constitutes the eternal, indestructible body. It is essential that we, that we are completely indestructible through and through. Why is this? Because of the mass fear that seems to be enveloping the world. What is this fear? That the nuclear bombs, the nuclear warfare will destroy all existence. What is it that we are afraid will be destroyed? Is it the mind, the consciousness, the soul? No. We know that consciousness, mind, soul, life itself is indestructible. What is it then? The fear is that the body will be destroyed. And this is exactly why the truth of what the body is, as it is presented in the ultimate, is going forth and reaching so many right today. It is essential to know that the body is complete, eternal, indestructible, imperishable. And I've noticed this whenever there seems to be a need for a greater revelation of any kind. God appears as that revelation. And because there seems at the moment 
to be a need for a revelation of what constitutes the body, God is appearing as that particular revelation. Now, let us ask a few questions. Will this revelation heal? No, it doesn't heal. What does it do then? Well, what it does is this. It reveals your body as the consciously perfect life it eternally is. And you will discover that you are not in need of healing. Now let's have another question. Will this revelation enable you to pay your bills, increase your salary, live better? Well, yes, all of this it will do, but much, much more. Actually, you will discover that nothing changes. You come into a consciousness that you are your own abundance. You are your own completeness. It will reveal the genuine substance that is your supply, but it will also reveal that your consciousness is this substance. It will reveal this substance is as indestructible and that it is as inexhaustible as is your own consciousness. It will reveal that it is ever-present because it is your own consciousness in form and you cannot be separated from your own consciousness. You cannot separate yourself from yourself. And just as surely as you are conscious, you have to be conscious as this one God consciousness. Just as surely as you are conscious, you are conscious as the consciousness that is all substance, all life, all form, all activity. Well, there's nothing outside the all. Well, then does not all the supply you could ever possibly need or wish or desire doesn't all of this supply have to exist in and as consciousness? And are you not conscious? Are you not consciousness then? Well, then is not this supply your own consciousness? How then can you be separated from your supply? You can't, not unless your consciousness can be separated from itself. And there is no separation in God. Sometimes this revelation of what you really are comes instantly. But with most of us, it seems a gradual expansion of consciousness. But above all things, I would like to leave this assurance with you. Every truth that is revealed in the ultimate or in anything you read or hear is already present in your own consciousness. The revelation is always from within because the truth itself is always present in and as your own consciousness. If there seems to be something wrong with your being, whether as body, affairs, or experience, it can only seem that there is something wrong with your seeing. Why? Because your being is your seeing. And your seeing is your being. You are what you see. You are what you perceive as conscious spirit and not what you seem to see, not what you seem to be as a mortal in a material universe. Now that which seems to be the matter body is like a dream. It is like a dream which forms its own dream substance into a body. But the dream, the substance of the dream, and the form of the dream are still the mirage. They are still the dream substance of the dream itself. The genuine and only body is mind, conscious spirit life, existing and maintaining itself in and as its own embodiment of its own eternal, conscious, changeless perfection. There is no mortal mind, for mind is conscious spirit. Thus the only mind in existence is the divine mind, and the only consciousness in existence is spiritual consciousness. The only body in existence is spiritual consciousness, 
spiritual awareness as its own embodiment or its own substance in form. So now you can see, dear one, that truly before Abraham was, you were. Before that which seemed to be a baby, before that which appeared to be birth, you were. Indeed, you are that principle, you are that essence, which includes all that it ever is essential to your completeness. You are your own intelligent power, you are your own control, you are your own maintenance. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over for side two. Now I would like to speak with you about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. Now there's been much controversy as to whether there ever was a Jesus Christ. Many have said that there was no Jesus Christ. Now if the question is, was there a personal Jesus, was there a human or a mortal being, even as you or as me, the answer has to be no. If the question is, was and is there an individual identity who revealed his glorious consciousness by his works, the answer is an unqualified yes. Now this thing, this same thing is true of us. Is there a spiritual God identity who is constantly revealing himself by being, acting, and appearing as just what God is? Then the answer is an unqualified yes. But Jesus was no more a human or a mortal being than you or I are a human or a mortal being. Now this spiritual identity that was named Jesus was for a little while called by this particular name. It is a false and futile thing to deny Jesus. If we deny him, we must deny that we exist. If there never was such an individual as the one they named Jesus, there is no individual right here. If there was no Jesus or no identity 
who was for a little second in eternity called Jesus. There is no identity who is for a second named Mary, John, or Marie. If we deny Jesus and his work, how can we claim to emulate him? How can we claim to perform our works? How can we claim to reveal to the individual his abundant supply, sinless purity, eternal perfection, if we deny Jesus and his works? I have noticed one thing, and that is, in almost every case where anyone comes out with a flat denial, that there was a Jesus Christ. This one who makes the denial is always very sure that he is the one and only one who is the Christ. This can only be when there is a great sense of an important little assumptive person. Now what we need to do is to understand Jesus we need to understand the spiritual significance of his words. We need to understand the spiritual significance of his works. Jesus' work was not to heal sickness. It was not to reform sinners. Rather, it was to show us our eternal identity and to awaken us to the conscious awareness of the eternal nature of our life, of our being, of our body. Now can you tell me which one of us, since what the one that they call Jesus walked the earth, which one of us has seen as much proved in our own experience? How can we say there was no Jesus Christ? The Master knew there was neither sickness or sin he knew there was no need of healing. He knew that God really is all, and that God could not manifest his pure perfection as sickness or sin or death. He knew that God could not identify himself as a sick, poor, or sinning individual. He knew that each individual is God-identified. Didn't he say, the kingdom of God is within you. If we can once just perceive that which was all so clear to Jesus, we can then perceive that which is true to us and as us. Jesus' mission was to dispel the dream. His mission was to reveal the perfection that had always been present, and that had always been all that was present. He even took on the aspect of a dreamer himself in order to fulfill his mission. But that isn't all. Jesus knew his identity as the very presence of God, individualized and identified. He never for one instant lost sight of or surrendered his identity. You'll remember in John, he said, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Note that, before the world was, before that which seemed to be the dream of materiality even appeared to descend. Glorify thyself, he said, as my beginningless, changeless, endless self. Let the eternal, glorious I that I am be manifested, be evident, not only as the I that I am, but as the identity that is everyone in existence. Let this be manifested that the world may awaken from that which appears to be its dream. This was the mission of Jesus. Even so, in the final analysis, Jesus knew there was no dreamer. 
He knew that that which seemed to be the dreamer was nothing but the dream. He knew that the dream itself was the dream's dream. He never recognized man with breath in his nostrils. Jesus even assumed the aspect that would have appeared to be the dream and the dreamer in order to fulfill that mission. Now when he prayed that the world might know that God had sent him, what he really meant was that even the so-called dreamers would awaken and recognize that he was the Father appearing as the Son. And dear one, this is just exactly what you are. This is exactly what I am. We are the Father appearing as the Son. The Father and the Son are but two different names for the same one, and this one is God. Hadn't Jesus said, As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Well, but of course, if God is life itself, then you and I have to be life in order to be alive. Now, does this sound as though the Son were the offspring of the Father? Isn't it clear that he knew that the Father is evident, that the Father is manifested as the Son? Well, for many, many years I have said the gift of God is himself. I remember saying that to a friend all oh, many years ago, and she seemed quite startled. And suddenly she turned to me and she said, well, what do you mean by that? The gift of God is himself. And I said, well, how could it be otherwise? God can only give of what he is, for God is all. There are many who speak of living by God's grace as though it were a great privilege to be able to live, as though God gave us this privilege, as though this privilege of living was something that God could either give by his grace or withhold. Well, actually, nothing could be farther than the truth. There is no such thing as living by God's grace. We live because we can't help living. We couldn't stop living if we tried. Why? Because the gift of God is himself. Because God is constantly giving, expressing, even being himself as himself. And this self is yourself. This self is my self. This self is the only self there is of any one in existence. Now you'll remember that Jesus said, If I speak of myself, I speak a lie. The Father, the Father that is in me, as me, he doeth the works. Well, this is true. What self was he talking about? Was he talking about a personal human self that could do something, have something, know something, be something of itself? No. What he meant was that if he spoke as though he were a human being or a self of himself, he was lying, for there was no such self. But it was God himself who existed as the one they called Jesus, who was performing the works, who was acting who was alive as that specific one. Now, he knew that a personal Jesus could do nothing. A personal Jesus could be nothing. But he also knew that as the very presence of the power of God and the power of the presence of God, he could do all. He could be all. Why? Because he was all power in complete uninterrupted operation, yes, in complete, unrepressed, irresistible operation, and he knew there was nothing in all infinity and in, and in eternity that could possibly interfere with 
or oppose this operation. Well, we might ask, what is the spiritual significance of Jesus' works? What is the spiritual significance of his crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension? What does all of this mean to us? There has to be some significance, and it has to be spiritual significance, because there is no, nothing material to have a significance. Now, someone has said of Jesus, he walked around in the dream awake. This is just exactly what you and I do when we discover that we are not dreamers. This is a very good way to state it, too. His experience was similar to the one you and I would have if we were to know the exact nature of the dream the dreamer was having, if we could know what he seemed to be seeing, feeling, and experiencing as he lay there on the bed dreaming, if we could know his dream, but at the same time know all the while that he was completely untouched by that dream. Know that he was not even dreaming, that the dream was its own dream. And, uh, of course, if the dream were a, a pleasant dream, we might just let the dreamer continue to seem to dream. But if it were a nightmare, we'd certainly attempt to waken him. In fact, when a dream, that which seems to be a dream, becomes a nightmare, always the awakening is not far behind. But anyway, that is just exactly what Jesus did. Now, why did Jesus experience or seem to experience the crucifixion? What was its purpose? It was to awaken not only those about him, but every one of us from that which seemed to be the dream. It was to reveal to those about him as well as to you and to me, that we do not have a life, an existence, a soul, or a body, separate and apart from God. This was Jesus' mission. This was the spiritual significance of his being here. This is a long, long way, isn't it, from that old belief that Jesus came to save the sinners or to heal the sick. How could Jesus have come to save the sinners or to heal the sick? If there were sinners, God permitted them. If there were those who were sick, God had to permit the sickness. What kind of a God would put anyone here and not only make him capable of sinning, but permit him to go right on sinning and then punish him for that which he made him capable of doing. What kind of a God would permit one of us to, through no fault of our own, be sick, suffer year after year after year, age and die, knowing all the while that we have done nothing on earth to deserve it, knowing all the while that if he was the only power, he had power to heal us, either of sin or of sickness. Now that just can't be God, and that just isn't God. No, the spiritual significance of Jesus' work was to reveal that we do not have a life, we do not have a soul or a body that begins that can change, that can suffer and die. We do not have a mind or a body that can sin or suffer. Now his mission was to reveal to each one of us the indestructible, pure, sinless nature of each individual identity, including this imperishable, changeless body. Well, we might ask, how did he accomplish this? Well, he accomplished it by appearing in the aspect of the dream to that which he seemed to feel was the dreamer. He let himself and his body seem to experience the same dream 
That seems to be the experience of every human being. He did this in order to teach us. He did this in order to reach us right where we seem to be and to awaken us to the realization that this is not a world of trouble, sickness, and sorrow, but the very kingdom of heaven right here and right now. It was after Jesus had performed his glorious works that he came to the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he was to reveal all the fallacy of personal love, depending on personal loyalty and support. Here he revealed that in the final analysis each identity is to stand as himself and to realize his own God consciousness spiritual strength, courage, power, and dominion. Here he revealed that each one of us will awaken to the fallacy of all personal love, personal hate, or resentment. He didn't even rebuke Peter when he told Peter that Peter was going to deny him. And when his disciple severed the ear of the servant of the high priest, Jesus just put out his hand and healed him. He knew there was no enemy to hate. He knew there was no hatred in love. He also knew that his conscious love, conscious eternal life, was his universe. He also knew that there was no actuality, no truth, nothing genuine in this whole seeming experience. Does this seem impractical to you? Indeed, it is most practical. You know the Bible says much about turning the other cheek. Well, actually, there is a principle behind this, and this principle is this. Once we recognize that there is nothing but the mind that is God, love in perfect harmony with itself as itself forever and eternally, we recognize that there is no struggle, there is no enemy. We are our own immunity to all the seeming shafts of that which would seem to be evil, misunderstanding, attack either so-called mental or physical attacks. Did Judas betray Jesus? No, he did not. Oh, what did he do then? Judas betrayed himself. And here is a tremendous point. All betrayal is self-betrayal. All betrayal is a false sense of self betraying itself, exposing itself. Our consciousness really is our universe. And if anything seems to operate in our universe, they would claim that it could be destructive to someone else. It is never destructive to that one. It is always self-destructive. There is no other kind of destruction. And what is destroyed in the final analysis? Really nothing. All that ever takes place is that the light itself must and does reveal itself and disperses the whole lying appearance of hate, of evil, of destruction, of envy, of anything or anyone that is perishable. Now you'll remember that Judas is said to have hanged himself in remorse. Well, there's your answer. Self-betrayal is always the obliteration of or seeming destruction of the little personal self. To deny the Christ as the very presence of God individualized is self-betrayal. To deny the Christ is to deny yourself. To de deny the Christ 
is self-denial. Now, what is the spiritual significance of Jesus' night in the Garden of Gethsemane? What does this mean to us? Which one of us has not, in the dream, relied on persons, asked them to wait with us just one hour? Which one of us has not, in the dream, encountered our Judas, our betrayer? Which one of us has not, in the dream, discovered that personal love, personal help, personal dependence was not enough protect us from the nightmare of seeming crucifixion? Ah, we know. These are no foreign experiences to us. In that which has seemed to be our dream, we have all experienced this very same thing. But Jesus was not dreaming. Actually, we're going to find out that we are not either. Jesus was awake, and we are awakening to the realization that impersonal love, the love that is God, never fails. It never deserts us. It never leaves us. How can it? It would have to leave itself if it left us. Why? Because we are that very self-identified. Love never deserts itself. Love never defeats. Love never fails itself. Love never deceives itself. Now we are beginning to perceive that every individual who truly loves, loves truly, because this individual is the very love that is God, expressed and manifested. There is no other love but the love that is God. No one can know love who does not know that he is love. Love is not an attribute of God. Love is God. God is love. Love is not an attribute of you or of me. You are love. Love is you. If love could be an attribute, and sometimes it is claimed that it is. One could either love or hate. But love is love, and love because it cannot help loving. Why? Because love being love has to be love. Furthermore, love does not begin to be love. Neither can love ever stop being love. Love is constant. Love is changeless. Love is beautiful. Love is all-embracing, all-permeating, all-being. Love is. And there is no hate. There is no one even dreaming of hate. Furthermore, we are learning that we can never be separate or apart from love because we are the very love that is God. We are this love expressed. We are this love individualized. We are this love as our very own consciousness. We can't be separated from our own consciousness. How then can we separate or be separate from love? We are becoming aware that in the love that we are, there is no resentment. There is no desire for revenge. There is no hatred. Neither is there an enemy to fight or to fear. There is no enemy to resist. There is no enemy to oppose. And there is no enemy who hates us, who seeks to harm us. There is no enemy who fights us. There is no enemy who fears us. There is no enemy who resists us. And there is no enemy who opposes us. God does not resent himself. God does not desire revenge upon himself. Love does not hate itself. Love does not fight itself. Love knows no fear. Love does not resist itself. And love 
does not oppose itself. Our consciousness really is our universe, and our consciousness is love. Our consciousness is also life. Our consciousness is truth. Ah, uh, I have seen wonderful things take place when one who seemed to be misunderstood and maligned just kept right on being love itself. This is no impractical dream. I can tell you this. I have seen it prove itself. This is practical everyday living again, and it proves out in your daily affairs. Now let us ask, what is the spiritual significance of the crucifixion? Well, of course, first of all, those who wish to crucify Jesus were seeking to end his life by destroying his body. But now, even as we go into this, please be aware that actually this is only the hideous nightmare, the belief, the dream, that there is a presence and a power that is not God. Nevertheless, this is what seemed to be taking place. Those, they wished to crucify Jesus, but it was, it seemed to be evil, seeking to end the life of Jesus, and the belief was that the only way they could end his life was by destroying his body. That is always the belief that in order to end life, the body must be destroyed in one way or another. But these who wished to destroy Jesus, they didn't know that his body was indestructible. Jesus knew it, but they didn't know it. And they didn't know that his life, his soul, his being and body were all one and the same thing. They didn't know that his life, his soul, his being, his body itself were all eternal, changeless spirit, and that no cross could bring this life, this eternal changeless spirit to an end, that no nail could penetrate this substance which is consciousness. They didn't know all this. You see, the dream is ignorance itself. The dream would be called lack of mind. Lack of mind would be no mind. How intelligent is a dream anyway? How intelligent is a dreamer? Have you ever noticed in what seems to be your night dream how unintelligently you seem to perform? How much sense does it make? It's ignorance. Well, if you see, if you see clearly, that that which appears to be the daydream is just as non-intelligent, just as uh, unreasonable, just as silly as that which seems to be the night dream, you begin to get a glimpse of the fact that in the, that which seems to be the daydream, there is no mind. It is not your mind. There's no intelligence at all. Well, if there is no mind, there is ignorance. If there is ignorance, there's nothing. Lack of mind is nothing, for God is all, and God is mind. But these, oh, these this ignorant, uh, uh, organized ignorance that wanted to destroy Jesus, they had never even seen the body of Jesus. Do you know that? They never had even seen the body of Jesus. If they were right here today, they could not see the body of you or of me, no matter what they thought they saw as bodies. You remember Jesus said, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. Yes. If they had seen the body of Jesus, they would have seen God. They would have had to see just what God is. Whenever we actually see the body, we see what God is. Yes, thou seest me, thou seest the Father, and thou seest that the Father is appearing right here as me. Would I be here if I did not include my body? No. Thou seest the Father. Thou seest that all of me, my body included, is just what the Father is and nothing else. No. Those who seem to be immersed in the dream, and remember Jesus was not, those who seem to be dreamers only saw a dream body. They saw a body 
that was composed of the stuff of the dream itself. It was composed of the ignorance of the dream itself. But they never saw the body of the one they called Jesus. Had they seen this body, they would have known how impossible it was to destroy it. Furthermore, had they been able to see this body, actually see it, they wouldn't have even wanted to or tried to destroy it because they would have seen with that spiritual vision as that spiritual vision, which is God himself being. And the whole hoax would have been exploded right then and, and there. But Jesus, you know, was not a dreamer. He knew the eternal nature of his life. He knew that his soul, his body were eternal. And he proved what he knew. He knew that he did not have the kind of body that could be destroyed. Well, neither do you or I have the kind of body that can be destroyed. And we, too, are beginning to prove that we have that body that is eternal, beginningless, changeless, endless, and that cannot perish from that which they call the earth. It was in the crucifixion that Jesus revealed his complete renunciation of the personal sense of self. You know, all of us have to renounce that little personal sense of self. I can remember in the Methodist Church when I was a girl, we had an old hymn that we used to sing, and it was entitled, I Surrender All. I Surrender All. Well, it's rather interesting to note that even in the old Orthodox beliefs, every once in a while they come out with something that is absolutely true, even though they don't know the spiritual significance and back of what they are saying. But when we say, I surrender all, we really are completely surrendering that which seems to be a mortal, a material sense of life, a mortal, a material sense of body. And it is in this that we begin to get some glimpse of what the crucifixion really meant. Yes, in the crucifixion, Jesus did reveal that he completely renounced the personal sense of himself. Now, you will remember that he asked one of the disciples to care for his mother. You remember that. Now, turning to her, he said, Woman, behold thy son. Now, this he did, pointing to the disciple. Does this sound like the love of one who considered him, himself as a son for one whom he considered to be his mother? Yet it was love, wasn't it? But it was not a personal love. But Jesus' love, his compassion, it showed here. He had compassion, not sympathy, you understand, but compassion. Even so, Jesus recognized no human sense of motherhood. He recognized no human sense of sonship. Yet, even when he was supposed to be suffering there on the cross, the great love that he was could say, This is your mother, to the disciple. Woman, behold thy son. Woman, thou hast lost nothing. Thou hast lost no son. This was what he was trying to say. Now you remember, Jesus had already said, Call no man your father who is upon the earth. Call no man your father who is upon the earth. Never call man with breath in his nostrils your father. Never call yourself a child that was born. Never call yourself the son of man. This is what Jesus means. Yet he knew that the father and the son were exactly the same but he also knew that there was no more a material father than there was a material son. 
If you were a material or a mortal being, God would have to be a material or a mortal God, because God really is all. This is what Jesus saw so clearly, and this is exactly what he was trying to point out, and did point out for those of us who are prepared to see it. Right there in that lesson when he said, Woman, behold thy son. Well, the disciple was just as much the son of the woman as Jesus was, and Jesus knew it. And actually, this is the only truth of mother and son anyway. It's the same life, the same eternal, beginningless, changeless, endless life. There is no human mother. There is no human son. There is no human father. There is no birth. There is no change. There is no death. Yes, he said, call no man upon the earth your father. He recognized, you know, he recognized that there was no other I but the one I. He knew there was no other identity but God identified. Now, you remember to the two malefactors he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Does this sound as though he thought they were miserable sinners? Did, this, did he ask them, did he say, if you repent and be good right now, confess your sins, that you'll be with me in paradise? Ah, oh, no. He didn't say, you have sinned. He didn't say, repent. You'll be forgiven. Nothing like that. He knew there was no sin. He knew there was no sinner. He knew that we do not repent for a night dream in which we may seem to have had experiences of which we might seem to be ashamed. He also knew that the moment we awaken, we know that we, this thing never happened. We know that we never were sinning in the night dream. We know that we never were a sinner in the night dream. We know that we don't have to repent for a dream. We know that we don't have to suffer for a dream. We know that we don't have to be punished or punish ourselves for a dream. We know what we are. We know. It is only though that when we are awake that we can realize that we never sinned. So long as we seem to be dreaming, we will seem to continue to sin and to suffer and to repent and to be punished or punished punish ourselves. Now, prior to this, Jesus had asked, <coughs> which one of you convinces me of sin? Now, he didn't expect them to go to paradise. He didn't expect those men to go to paradise at all. He didn't think they were going to go to heaven. He knew they'd never been out of heaven. He didn't. He didn't uh, think that they were going to have to die and then go to heaven. He knew they'd never been out of the kingdom of God. How could they be when God is everywhere and God is all? Now, what he really meant was, right now you are the very same God expressed that I am. For God is all. God is the only one. God is the only one who can be expressed or identified as anyone. This day, right now, you are pure, perfect, sinless, eternal, conscious life. And you are this life identified. You are no other life. This is our lesson from the crucifixion. We too are awakening to the fact that there is no little I that can sin or suffer. There is no little I that can be ill or that can die. We too are learning that there is no condemnation there's no one condemned. We, too, are seeing that the only I in existence is that God I am. We, too, are beginning to see that there is no sickness, no suffering, no sin, nor impurity in the holy temple which we are. Now, what is the spiritual significance of the resurrection? Every new truth, you remember, 
is considered unreasonable at first. But now here Jesus was supposed to be three days buried in matter. Now, Jesus knew that all this was going to take place. He knew that this whole picture was going to have to unfold, this whole dream picture. Now, it was supposed to be dark in that sepulcher, you remember? The great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher was supposed to shut out the light, to imprison Jesus in the darkness of materiality. There, life, consciousness, mind, intelligence, were supposed to be in the darkness of ignorance, to be unconscious of its genuine identity as God, Spirit, identified. The darkness was supposed to be complete, death, no nothingness. But was it? No. If Jesus was there, the light was there, the enlightened consciousness of being eternal, joyous, free, perfect, glorious life, was fully expressed right there, and there was no darkness at all. Now, we're not speaking of the light of the sun, you know. We're speaking of the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, the dream. Of course that light could not be confined or destroyed. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. What does this mean to us? Neither can we be imprisoned in the ignorance, the dream, that the universe is matter. We cannot be in the, imprisoned in the belief that we are poor, sick, suffering, sinning human beings. We cannot be deluded that we have a temporary life or body separate from God. What is the spiritual significance of the ascension? A great spiritual pioneer once said, in speaking of Jesus, he never left heaven for earth. This is a tremendous truth. Jesus never really ascended. He had never descended into the materiality of the dream world. Actually, he revealed the significance of the ascension just before he entered the Garden of Gethsemane. It was in his beautiful prayer in the evening just before he went with his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. This was, of course, before the crucifixion or the resurrection. You will find it in the 17th chapter of John, from the 20th verse to the end of the chapter. Here he tells us clearly that we are each and every one the very presence of God. Here he tells us that we have never descended, we have never left heaven for earth, that it is the same God glorifying itself as each one of us. He reveals that to accept this truth and awaken is to realize that God himself is the only identity and the only one identified. Jesus prayed not just for the disciples, but for you, for me, for each identity who accepts the Christ of his own being, who is becoming aware that his only identity is God, the Father, manifested as the Son. Now you and I can joyously pray, I live, O God, because thou art forever alive as my life. I am conscious because thou, my God being, art forever conscious as the consciousness I am. I love because thou, my God being, art eternal love expressed as the love that I am. I am this and none other, and I know it. I hope you enjoy this spiritual audio. Like, share and subscribe for more.